I just, is everyone okay with that? <laughs> it's still hit continue. If not, please text me. Um, all right, so welcome everyone to this beautiful, beautiful event and this wonderful space. Um, if you are watching us on Facebook Live, thanks for joining us from there. Um, uh, but we're really excited to, um, um, to be here and to sort of like have these conversations today. I'm Sangi, um, I use she and they pronouns. Um, I'm wearing a blue top with white stripes on it with big earrings, glasses, um, and a bright lipstick. And I also have some flowers and a blackboard and Solange in the background um, and some uh, plants and uh, it's a well-lit space that I'm sitting in. Um, I am zooming in from as are most of the panelists and folks who are here to talk to us today from Chicago, which is the unceded homelands of the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Adawa nations. Um, many other communities such as Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac and Fox also called this area their home. Um, and we are at this event, Abolition and, Ra and the Radical Imaginaries. Um, my students came up with that name. Um, uh, it's a culmination of uh, the class that I have been lucky to teach. Uh, it's in UIC Black Studies, cross-listed with criminology, law and justice, and sociology departments. Um, the class is called Race and the Politics of Incarceration. And this class is sort of a culmination event of all the things that we have been thinking through, struggling with, engaging with throughout this semester. And my students have really sort of like troubled some of the ways that, you know, we have some shared understandings. Um, they've engaged with each other with utmost respect and kindness, but also challenging each other in the most beautiful ways. And, um, you know, they're um, sort of moving towards not finding answers, but asking more questions, expanding their horizons, and for some, finding ways to engage in the work of abolition um, and sort of trying to move their needle and others around them. Um, so I really, really am grateful for my students to um, have engaged in this process and for teaching me through this process and for sort of showing up and stepping up and putting this event together and being engaged on all aspects of this, organizing this event. Um, so their leadership and brilliance is really what's shining today and that's bringing this, that's creating the space for all of us to learn from. Um, we have a wide audience today and we'd like to just kind of um, ask you all to practice what we've been trying to practice in my class. Um, we practice respect towards each other and also thinking through and practicing what anti-racism looks like in practice, not just theory. Um, and so what that means is when you're engaging with this event through comments, through questions, please ask yourself, you know, where that question is coming from and try to practice anti-racism in the way that you move with us today and uh, engage with our panelists today as well, and our moderators. Um, you have both chat and Q&A functions here. Um, Hannah and I will be um, sort of moving, uh, looking through the chat and Q&A and filtering the questions for our moderators to ask the panelists. And I also want to just kind of acknowledge um, that there may be triggers in today's conversation for people who are entering into, and for all of us who are at the event, organizing the event, um, that you know anything may trigger us um, based on our experiences of what we've witnessed and what we've um, struggled with. And so I ask that all of you um, support yourselves, um, have all the tools that you need in order to stay grounded and stay present with us because people are here to share um, some rich thoughts and experiences that we can all benefit and learn from. Um, and that's all I have to say. Um, without further ado, I will pass the event on to Sky and Autumn who will moderate the event and move us through the next um, pieces and engage with our panelists. Thank you all again for being here. 
Oh yes, good morning everybody. Just to echo, thank you for coming and joining. Um, we are very excited to do this event. I know I'm excited, I'm a student. This is my first class event for something very, um, something that I hold dear to my heart um, in terms of passions. So like I said, my name is Skye um, and I am a student. I'm 19 years old. I am currently wearing just a plain black long sleeve V-neck top sitting in a bright room, um, my dining room. Um, and I would like to first introduce Brisha Meadows, who is one of our panelists and is a member of the Lifted Voices Collective, currently an intern at Uptown People's Law Center. Um, at the age of 14, she was incarcerated for shooting her abusive father in self-defense and to protect her and her mother, um, which encouraged her to want to work with and help others in similar situations. Um, and we also have Lil Tree as one of our panelists, who is a high school senior at Kenwood Academy. Um, she is an organizer, mobilizer, and strategizer. And her initial entry to organizing started with Asada's Daughters, Ujima Medics, and Black Lives Matter um, stationed in Chicago. And she bulldozes when it comes to dismantling systems that perpetuate harm from all things colonial, capitalist, and patriarchal. And she fights this battle with the sword of intersectionality. Who, and um, she is little tree fertilizing this earth for all future saplings. All right, hello everyone. My name is Autumn. I use she, her pronouns. I'm 20. I am wearing a blue collared shirt and I've got a blue background and I'm sitting next to a sunny window. I wear glasses and I've got dark hair. Um, I'd first like to introduce Asha Edwards. She is a student at UIC, a black abolitionist, community organizer with Asada's Daughters and We Are Dissenters and a visual artist. She's a feminist and anti-imperialist. Asha enjoys engaging in campaigns that put cracks in the foundations of white supremacy, policing, settler colonialism, patriarchy, and imperialism. And last but not least, our last panelist is Benji Hart, a Chicago-based author, artist, and educator. Their essays and poems have appeared in numerous anthologies, and their commentary has been published at Teen Vogue, Time Magazine, The Advocate, and others. They have led workshops for organizations and at academics, inst institutions, and internationally, and facilitated convenings for groups like Law for Black Lives, National Bailout, and the Social Justice Initiative's Portal Project. Their performances have been featured at CA2M Madrid, Museo Universito, oh, I'm sorry, I'm butchering this, Del Chapo, in Mexico City, Break in New York, and elsewhere. They have been a fellow at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, McDowell, and Three Arts Awardee. Thank you, everyone, and I'm so excited for this conversation today. Now, for our panelists, if you'd like to each take a few minutes to introduce yourselves, um, we can start with Brisha, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brisha Meadows. Um, I kind of just, I wanted to come today. Sorry, I'm probably going to stutter a little bit. I'm a little nervous, but I kind of just wanted to keep, um, you know, like informing others and stuff that, you know, like goes on and everything that I've learned and everything that I take away from it. So I really wanted to come here and speak today. I'm 19 and I went to see, I go to CSU and I'm a member of the Lifted Voices and I'm also interning doing digital communications at the Uptown People's Law Center. That's, that's all I have to say though. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's perfectly all right. Um, Asha, would you like to introduce yourself next? Uh, what are you doing here today and what you're working on currently? Yeah, um, I'm Asha. My pronouns are she, they, and uh, what have I been working on? Well, I've been, you know, helping coordinate um, mutual aid runs with UIC dissenters. We have been working on this mutual aid project since the fall to directly assist um, unhoused people living at a housing encampment. And we've helped them, um, like we 
kind of collaborated with some other groups who are trying to get them into permanent housing. So we're assisting them just like there's solidarity, not charity, like directly asking what they need and stuff. And, you know, just trying to support our people. And I have been a part of Asada's Daughters with them, you know, part of a fellowship, just helping with programming and stuff. And also I'm in like a summer project that will be like announced very soon that's geared towards arts and abolition like an arts pop -ed. So I'm really excited for that. And, you know, I'm a student at UIC. So if you see me, say hi. Thank you for joining us. Um, little Chi, would, would you like to go next? Yeah, I can. I'm a Little Chi. My pronouns are anything to say with love and respect. Um, right now we're in black leggings, uh, army, crop top jacket, I changed, yes I did. And a red shirt, red tank top, red scarf, yeah. Um, and what am I doing that relates to abolition right now? Well, I think a lot of things that I do is related to abolition. A lot of my org um, support campaigns from like, you know, Cop Academy to Cop South CPS, who do a lot of work towards like, yeah, abolishing the police because they don't mean safety for youth and I'm a youth and I'm a fight for the youth. Um, I do mad work with Ujima Medics, which is also an organization that gives workshops, trainings on how to respond when people get shot or stabbed or are having an asthma attack, a lot of health issues that really affect black and brown communities. Um, and I've done work with FDLA, Know Your Rights workshops, et cetera, et cetera. I just feel like I've been all around. And a lot of my work just comes back to policing because everything is so intersectional and always ties back to Please I completely agree. Thank you so much. Um, and that leaves us with Benji. Benji, if you would like to say a few words about yourself, go right ahead. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So grateful to be here. My name again is Benji Hart. I go by any pronoun said with respect. Um, I'm a light skinned black femme. I have short curly hair in a blowout. Um, and I'm in a uh, right next to a window in my living room with some posters behind me, including uh, one poster that says Black Trans Lives Matter. Um, I'm an author, artist, and educator. I'm 31 years old, um, and I am originally from Amherst, Massachusetts, but I've been living in Chicago for about nine years, um, and I really do my best to figure out, especially as someone who is not originally from Chicago, um, how the skill set that I have can support abolitionist work um, and support campaigns and movements on the ground led by um, Chicagoans. Um, so as an artist, as an educator, I'm trying to figure out how I can plug in um, to support uh, the work that other folks are doing is a lot of sort of how I frame my own uh, relationship to abolition. Um, and I've done a work with No Cop Academy as have a lot of other folks on the panel. Um, as well as other abolitionist campaigns, uh, coalitions and programs in the city and uh, continuing to use education and arts to uh, support and um, uh, bring in more folks into movement um, is the, the sort of how I frame a lot of the work that I do. Oh, that is so wonderful to hear from all of you. Thank you for introducing yourselves and sharing a little bit about who you are currently and what, you know, what brought you here today to want to make you want to speak. Um, we are going to move forward to a kind of free for all question to all of you, any of you can answer. Um, and we do have kind of this like, either raise your hand or say in the chat, which one of you wants to go next or add a comment or anything just so that we're not interrupting each other's being over um, or speaking into. Um, and so the first question we have is kind of, what exactly does abolition mean to you? Some of you touched on this a little bit, but just to kind of elaborate, um, any one of you can go first. Okay, I can go. Um, and I, I, whenever people ask me this, it just reminds me of my, how much I've struggled with learning about abolition and things like that, how long it's taken me to be comfortable with saying I'm an abolitionist. And I don't know, abolition to me, of course, means abolishing the police, but more than that means 
Um, well, what does that mean, Ani? You can't just define a word with the same word. Um, abolition means abolishing the police, aka dismantling all systems that perpetuate the harm that they cause. Um, and even more than that, when I say abolish the police, I don't just mean the prisons and I don't just mean CPD and I don't just mean the military and things like that. I mean the culture of policing that we all like perpetuate on a daily basis um, from in our schools to things like tardies and et cetera to like, I don't know, how I have to let people know I'm going on to the bathroom at work, like all forms of policing. Um, Cause they all affect us on every sense of level. It's all about controlling and you know, Thank you so much for that response. Would any of the other panelists like to respond to that? Or even what's led you to, to be involved with abolition? Um, for me, I like, I remember I was in like a Saudi status programming and we were learning about the history of policing and the history of prisons. And then it just kind of clicked because honestly, I never really, felt safe with police. Like they didn't make me feel safe in my neighborhoods. They didn't do anything. They weren't beneficial. And I was like, oh, wait, well with history, it makes sense that they're not keeping us safe because they're not meant to, that's not their duty. Their duty is to protect stolen property on, you know, a settler colonial land. And the police, they protect capitalism. They protect white supremacy. So, I was like, oh, well, prisons and policing do not work because they do not keep us safe. And, you know, what led me to believing in abolition was, it was like a summer little workshop series where they taught about the alternatives to addressing harm. And that's what really made me believe in abolition because I'm like, we do keep us safe. It's gonna be difficult, of course, but only the people can really keep themselves like safe. So. I guess that was like the lead on to abolition, just not really believing in it from the jump. Like they didn't really do much for me. <laughs> I could definitely add on. Um, I think the only thing I might add to what folks have already said is that for me, um, abolition is about material shifts. It's about addressing and threatening um, white supremacy um, and systems of racism and militarism and colonialism and you know all these big words that we use. Um, it's about actually threatening them materially um, and actually redistributing resources in an equitable way and creating a public safety through the equitable distribution of resources rather than through force and through violence. Um, and just as folks have already said, that means a commitment to materially threatening and undoing white supremacy, not just by abolishing police and prisons, but by fighting for universal health care, um, by fighting for the return of stolen land, by um, fighting for the abolition of the military, fighting for the abolition of ICE and of detention centers, um, and understanding all of these systems as actually being part of the same structures of historical violence and harm, and not just talking about how those structures are bad, but actually demanding that they be actively dismantled and that their resources be redistributed um, to the communities that they've harmed. I can um, also kind of agree with not at first really believing in like abolitionist, like, like even just like the thoughts of it, I guess you would say, like, I'm like, we can't stop prisons, like, or, it was like, to me, it just became like, oh, that's just me, we're gonna take away prisons. But then it's like, I started working with people that like, that's a way of living, you know, like we're, that's, that's the thought, you know, we're trying to figure out how we can help people, how we can get like the whole structure of policing to just like, just a whole different structure, basically. Basically to me, abolition is just ending, it's not just ending policing, but it's like trying to find a whole new structure and a new way to do things, whether it's mental health, like maybe you need to go to a mental health facility, or it's something like, you know, like in that nature. Um, I feel like a lot of that came from when I was 14 and I did go to jail. I feel like a lot of that helped me to understand, like, I don't think anybody should have to go through that. Although juvenile might be not as worse as like a real, like a prison, like juvenile prison might not be as bad as adult prison, 
it made me like open my eyes to see like they're forcing people who aren't like even sound convicted of the crime they're forcing people who aren't convicted of crimes to sit in a cell 24 hours whether it's seven hours they're away from what they know and I don't know it's like that was kind of like a wake-up call like this isn't right I gotta try to figure something out to help other people thank you all so much for those responses and I just would like to ask while we're while we're discussing prisons do you agree, and this goes out to all of you, that prisons are normalized in our society and why? Also, what do you think about this normalized idea that some people just belong in prisons? When I hear that, that just makes me want to be like, what? Like, ew, get away from me if you feel like that. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, no, people don't deserve to be in a cage. We don't even like to see our dogs and animals and pets in a cage. Why would we want to throw a whole human being in there? That is so ridiculous to me. I, it is the most inhumane thing ever. And I don't care what anybody does. You don't have no right to sit there and throw somebody in a cage. Because if you try to throw me in a cage, I'm throwing him. Anyways, that's a separate note, though. Um, yeah, and I definitely think prisons is normalized. Um, it's very much embedded within like how we're socialized and we see it on tv and things like that that if you do something wrong it's right that we send you into timeout if you do something wrong it's right that we send you out the classroom if you do something wrong it's right that we send you into jail and it's always about consequences and penal um punitive punitive responses and reactions that aren't actually uh what they say to rehabilitate the person right um yeah, I don't think people should go to jail and very much they get socialized and we teach, we teach people at a very young age, right? Like, oh, if you keep doing acting up, right, I'm going I'm to call the police on you. If you keep acting up, I'm going to call the police or something, you know? Um, and it's very much internalized that that is what is supposed to happen, right? That that is okay, that we don't want those people in our society, even though those people are our community. Um, yeah. And we justify it by saying like, oh, they did something wrong and not yeah, actually trying to address root causes of harm and violence. I think what I might add to that, um, yeah, I think, I think Lil Treat hit it on the head uh, when they were talking about uh the way it's though the way our understanding of, of police and prisons as necessary is really built on our lack of connection to other people um and our alienation from other communities and i actually think abolition or the idea of relying on systems other than policing and incarceration and punishment um isn't such a radical idea when we think about it in relationship to people that we know and care about and have relationships with um that when it's your mom who has a drug addiction, the idea that police in prison isn't necessary is not a radical idea. It's like, yeah, that's my mom and she needs treatment, she needs therapy, she needs resources of support. Whereas when it's a stranger in the alley having a mental health crisis or when it's uh, someone I'm passing on the street who uh, I perceive as being from a different community or a different experience or someone that I don't know and have a relationship with that I see uh, struggling uh, with addiction, uh, I'm more inclined to think, yeah, what well, that person needs incarceration, that person needs the police to come get them because they're making me feel unsafe. Um, so, so much of our belief in the necessity of these systems is, I mean, it's rooted in many things that I hope we can get into in the time that we have today. Um, but I think one of those things and one of the ways that the system is perpetuated um, is, is segregation and alienation from other people in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our community. Um, that make it easier to call down the violence of those systems because uh, we feel fear and we uh, we feel alienation from other people. Um, and I think one of the one of the most important ways to build an abolitionist future is is really just starting with relationship building. Is really just starting with getting to know the people in our building, in our uh, on our block, in our neighborhood. Um, because when we have relationships with people, a we uh, can call on those relationships to prevent harm and violence in ways that 
make the police and prison system obsolete, but B, I think it also uh, taps into a different part of our brains and our consciousness when we know someone, because when we know people um, and we care about them, we want resources for them to help them deal with the problems that they're going through. Whereas when we don't know people and we're afraid of them and feel alienated from them, um, it's much easier to justify and believe um, that we need a police and a prison system to, to protect us from those other people. Yeah, uh, to add on to what Benji and Little Tree said, um, I was just thinking about how there's a lot of propaganda about prisons like crime mystery shows or cop shows that just show the quote unquote worst of society to make you afraid of the outside. And that's very intentional because they're trying to make sure that people believe in prisons like, dang, they need it die or something and what I say to that is like so when you come to like the most I say violent people that you see end up on these shows that represents like a small percentage of a majority of people in prison because a majority of people in prison are trying to survive capitalism and the thing is we could resolve violence if you really wanted to and also People who commit violence often sometimes have, well, I'm talking about like white people who commit violence. They often have enablers. They often have power. They often have resources to commit their violence because they just feel entitled to. So in those like crime shows, there's always something left out. And I think we need to kind of believe that everybody is like deserving of life and However, you should have the right to defend yourself and not be criminalized. Because like in this society, we are still impacted by patriarchy, misogyny, all kinds of embedded violence because this country is founded on violence. So the culture is violent. And um, that's why we need to really tackle and like just dismantling this state that was founded on genocide, founded on chattel slavery, and maintained through imperialism, and maintained through capitalism. So I feel like we really have to realize how this is normalized and how it's not normal. Our ancestors, our ancestors like in Africa, a lot of our cultures did not use prisons to resolve our problems. And I feel like we sometimes forget that, like prisons were not always the answer even dungeons, like they did not exist in every society. Well, thank you all for answering. I think all the responses we've gotten were beautifully worded. Um, and it kind of really leads into our next question, which Benji really uh, touched on about um, harm happening within our own communities against each other, for each other, you know, self-defense, which was touched on as well. What can we do besides calling the police to solve the issues and the harm done to our communities? Because we've already talked about the police being an integral part in kind of fueling this like machine of violence against ourselves. Do you mind, can you repeat the question one more time? Yes, so I'm essentially asking that if there is harm happening within our own communities, you know, what resources can we reach and access besides calling the police, which we've already discussed our, you know, negative responses. Um, I don't know. I think I kind of, this is a question that myself, um, I kind of go through a lot, like trying to answer this question, because when I try to explain, like in my, like in my situation, when I was younger, it's like, I tried to go to a lot of different, um, resources when there was things like domestic violence happening, like I kind of tried all the resources. So this question is like an answer to me too. Like this is a question I would have as well, because it's like a lot that you can do as in like 
safety planning and stuff like that. But like an example, like domestic violence, it's kind of like, what do you do in that situation? Because I went to the police, I went to CSB, I went to like counseling, I went to a lot of different things. And it's like, it didn't really help because they, it didn't change anything. You know what I mean? So, I mean, maybe that's just domestic violence in specific for me, but like, I mean, there's things like, say there's like stealing or, you know, a, something like that. Something we could do is like, we could like try to talk to the person. Well, not talk to the person, you know what I mean? Cause like, who's gonna go up to somebody that's stealing from them? But like at the, if you really want to, you know what I mean? You can go up to people and like tell them like, you could talk to them first, try that. You could try to like, you know, stuff like that. Sorry if I'm stuttering over my words a little bit, but um, yeah, I just feel like that's a question that would also be answered for me too. So if anybody has an answer, that would be great too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I kind of shared a few links to some pretty in-depth websites of like creative interventions or ways you can like, um, one, one way I would suggest is like pod mapping in which you basically start with like a circle of, you know, the closest people to you that you feel like you can go to in an emergency and then kind of branch out from there of like organizations you can go to. And I feel like um, with the domestic violence situation, I kind of wish there were more safe houses in Chicago that you can go to, like call a specific number. They can get you a Lyft or an Uber to go to a safe space just to like deal with, you know, this intense trauma because um, oftentimes there is, you know, what's the word? I would say like brain damage, but it's like when you're traumatized, your brain changes and you need a way to like heal from that. You need space away. And in those moments of intense violence that you're just trying to escape, people don't have those spaces to go to. So that's sometimes like, sometimes a start for some people. And also, I would like to kind of talk about transformative justice, which is a way of centering the survivor of harm and then addressing the abuser, like in a way that kind of makes the abuser unlearn the harmful behaviors that led to like specific violence. And also, I, I feel like people need to really, what Benji said, commit to relationship building because your neighbors, um, I know a lot of people in apartment complexes don't talk to their neighbors. And I'm like, when something goes down, like they could probably support you. And I just really want to emphasize like in these emergencies, we really have to depend on each other because the state will not take care of us. They do not really care about us. So we just really have to really build that kind of loving community. I, just, I was going to say kind of the same thing you were talking about, Asha. And I was just going to say, I don't trust the state. And honestly, like, yeah, state funded things are kind of whack right now, unless you white and super privileged and got money like that. Um, so, I, yeah, whenever people would just be like, oh, there's therapy, there's this, there's these, all these, like, I, I don't know. Oh, it just, I miss feelings about it. Um, and it's not always accessible for people. And there's a lot of mixed feelings inter internally people have to deal with that, right? There's a lot of unlearning about mental health stigmas we gotta do to be able to be willing to do those things. And so I just, to answer the question, I just lean on me. <laughs> we are not strong. I just feel like, yeah, lean on your community. And I, when we talk about it, I know when I, especially like, I'm, I'm from Chicago, the South side, you know, off 79th. And so when I'm talking to my hood people, like, yeah, we got to build stronger relationships with community and stuff. It seems so far to them, right? It seems like an endless horizon and things like that. And to put that in simpler terms is talk to your peoples, right? Yo, there's stuff going on. Let's make a, let's make a plan, right? Um, come through this window. Come through this window when something's popping off at your house, right? I'm going to have this key always right here or things like that. Or just, hey, how do you like, you know, to be interacted or experienced when you're upset or angry or when you're sad and just having those basic conversations creates a lot more trust with people so people can talk to you about those things um and I think even for me I try to have those conversations now because I know when there's a lot of stuff going on I like to shut up 
I don't like to tell people what was when I got a lot going on. And most of the time, I I'm in my it's I'm at a point in my life where it's hard. It's the hardest to reach out. Um, so making sure I'm putting those things in place before I get there, so that way it'll be easier to communicate or other people kind of know what to do. Like, hey, here's this playlist of songs I like to listen to. When I'm feeling real anxious or if I don't have a panic attack, this is this what helps me. These are signals that I have or body body things that you can recognize me when something's off. Um, and just having those those conversations just because state things, state um, funded things, people are not always, you know, I don't know, in support of that or yeah, have the best relationship with those things. And I don't know, I definitely know in the black community, people love to mind their business, which can be very harmful, right? Um, but just making making sure people know that my business is your business and your business is my business. And yeah. I think again, Lil Tree is touching on something really important. And I think for me as an abolitionist, I think it's important to acknowledge how many answers we don't have um, and how many uh, how much of what we're what we're talking about and trying to figure out um, we are just as inexperienced as anyone else and you know abolition is an experiment abolition is something that we're striving towards and working towards and trying to figure out all the time um, and it's messy and imperfect work um, and I think it's actually important to acknowledge that instead of trying to pretend that it's not um, and I think Lil Tree is pointing to just one of the messy parts of it which is when we talk about abolition, are we talking about redistributing funds from the police and prison system to other uh, state departments and state led or controlled resources? Or are we talking about putting them directly into community? Um, and even that is like a actually a really difficult conversation, um, like not an easy conversation to have. Like, like we very often say, uh, you know, uh, uh, like defund police and fund education, defund police and fund uh, mental health. Um, but that's complicated because as Lil Tree is talking about, like schools have a history, a long history of policing and harming black and brown young people. Mental health care uh, and therapy in its sort of traditional forms um, is not liberatory, is not, you know, was not created with hood folks in mind, with black and brown folks in mind, with trans and queer folks in mind. So it's really complicated um, and imperfect and messy. And uh, I think one of the hardest parts about talking about abolition is sometimes the answers are not satisfying. Sometimes the answers are not like, here's, here's the five step plan. And if we just follow this, we will have a perfect and peaceful utopian society. Um, as an abolitionist, I cannot offer that. And I do not have that five step plan. And I think even more importantly than that, when we talk about abolition, we're, we're not talking about a utopian society. We're not talking about a perfect society where no harm happens and, and no violence happens. Um, I think even in an abolitionist society, even in my most perfect vision for a society, um, harm and violence will continue to happen because that's a part of human relationships. Um, and at the same time, I think a police and a prison free society is one where much less harm will happen um, and where there will actually be uh, resources for more effective responses to harm when it happens. Um, and I think that's one of the most important pivots to have is to understand that not only is the police and prison system actually not deterring or stopping uh, much of the harm and violence that we've been taught or told it stops or intervenes on, it's actually contributing. It's actually a source of violence, a source of sexual violence, a source of death, a source of trauma uh, and of crisis. Um, and that any, uh, any resources that we take away from that system and put into um, resources that actually support our communities go much further in preventing violence down the road um, than further investments in the police and prison system do, even when those uh, investments themselves are imperfect. Like we have a long way to go. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge how long, how, how, how many generations of trauma the police and prison system has inflicted um, and, and realizing that it's gonna be a long fight to heal that trauma. It's gonna be a long fight to address that trauma. We're not talking about something that happens in a month or a week or a year. Um, we're talking about collective commitments we, we are making to transforming these systems and transforming our neighborhoods and our communities um, that will take just as long as it's taken to get us to this point. Um, to actually see that transformation through.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, those responses were amazing. And I think it helps, helps all of us visualize a little bit better what abolition looks like because um, I feel like it's easy sometimes to talk about, yes, we need to get rid of these systems, but visualizing what that what comes after that is not always not always crystal clear. And like Benji, you were saying, like there is no five step process. There is no just one clear answer and it's not a utopian. And so it is difficult for folks to to fully understand. So I really appreciate the, the responses you all gave. Um, okay, I think we're going to jump into a couple of questions for individual panelists. And if it's all right, I'd like to start with a question for Brisha. So we've got a question specifically about your experience. As a survivor of interpersonal violence, how has your experience with this abuse informed your understanding of abolition? Um, it's sorry, it looks like Brisha got disconnected. Um, I'll follow up. Um, okay, my bad. Um, sorry. No, that's okay. We'll switch to a different one then while Brisha rejoins. Um, Benji, we've got a question for you. Given that we have police and prisons now, what kind of what kinds of harm reduction items can we engage in at the moment? So what current resources do we have for that? Um, that's a good and a complicated question. Um, I think I'll try and answer this briefly because I actually think other folks on the panel have already done, some, done a great job of kind of uh, incorporating this response. Um, but I do think um, some of the most important resources we have are community. Um, and so A, that means individual relationships and getting to know our neighbors and, um, and building abolitionist relationships with the people around us in our building and on our block, um, as folks have already uh, mentioned. But I think it also means looking to community-based um, organizations and resources and responses. Um, so it's not that we all are doing this all as individuals, it's something that actually very much requires collective action, action that we take together. So I think also getting linked up with and plugged in with organizations and campaigns that are also trying to answer these questions. Um, so like Ujima Medics that um, Lil Tree is very connected with is a great example of community training each other up um, to respond to health crises and then also being the first responders to health crises in communities where we know um, very often uh, like medical help isn't there or takes a really long time, sometimes a, a fatally long time to get there. Um, and that when it does come, it often comes with police. It often comes with the threat of incarceration um, for the people who are experiencing the medical emergency. Um, so that's a great example of A, folks building an abolitionist future in the moment, but B, an example of a great organization to link up with. It's like, if that's, if that's a skill you need or you know is needed in your building or your neighborhood, Ujima Medics exists to train people up in that and to connect people to a community of folks who are doing that work. Um, Circles and Ciphers here on the north side uh, where I live uh, is a group that uses circle keeping and hip hop arts um, to uh, primarily train young men of color, not exclusively, um, but primarily young men of color um, to circle keep with one another so that A, again, folks throughout the community have circle keeping as a uh, skill set. Um, circle keeping being um, ways of dealing with community harm and conflict uh, through uh, dialogue and building accountability collectively um, within the community. Um, circle keeping is one tool or one method for doing that. Um, and Circles and Ciphers trains young people to do that and also is actively building relationships with young people in the neighborhood to do that so that when harm and when uh, violence happens, there's actually already infrastructure in place um, for folks to know who to go to and how to hold space for the harm that's happened, um, rather than being lost or bewildered or having no one else to turn to but the state. Um, so I think it's important, yes, to build relationships, but also to be building up our hard skills as much as we can around uh, responding to harm and violence um, and just crisis in general. Um, and there are so many different organizations in the city 
um, speaking of a Chicago specific context uh, that folks should be actively linking up with and talking to, especially uh, if you are in the neighborhood where that organization is based or the side of the city where that organization is based, um, looking for organizations in your immediate, facility, uh, immediate vicinity um, is also a way, again, of building relationships and also building up hard skills. Um, and the more of those we have, the more alternative responses we have um, to look to each other and not the state. Um, and I wanna reiterate again that I know that that can sound scary or, or even the idea of like not relying on the police in prison can sound radical. Um, and I think it's important to note how, how, again, how much we actually often do that when it's people we have personal relationships with um, and B, how much people with resources, wealthy folks, white folks, um, folks with other kinds of material privilege don't need to rely on the state when they are experiencing harm and crisis because they have so many resources actively available to them. Um, so A, I think we're talking about building up our own skill set and building our own relationships um, and networks of support in these moments of crisis. Um, but again, that's also why abolition is concerned with material shifts um, because Black and brown communities should have the same access to resources to deal with um, drug addiction that wealthy white communities have. Um, immigrant and undocumented communities should have the same access to, to counseling and um, community support systems that wealthy and white folks do when they're experiencing um, intimate partner violence or the things that are ubiquitous to all of our communities, um, but only certain communities have the resources to respond to um, without the carceral state getting involved. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add, because like you reminded me of something that went like um, everybody has a role in community wellness, community safety, community like led interventions and stuff. And I feel like we cannot be afraid because like at this point, I feel like if you're not taking any kind of like I want to say um, if you're not taking like a step towards at least trying to address the issues in your community, then I feel like it's a nice time to start because you can't pretend that the stuff in your neighborhood is not happening. And who else is better than knowing what's going on than you? So, you know, you should kind of mobilize with your people, um, probably help organize community talks or cookouts, maybe, you know, after pandemics. And yeah, we gotta just, get together more. Cause like, I know um, when I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to walk outside. And that was just like, well, why can't I go outside? And I was just learning about the communal violence that happens. And I kind of wish like, if I was with like maybe an uncle or an older cousin who could kind of show me like what's going on, then maybe I could kind of help, uh, you know, ask for, well, not ask, but demand certain resources. Like, take the opioid crisis. Often when you go into an opioid, like OD at the hospital, they'll probably release you and they won't try and get you in rehab. And I'm like, so they don't get any help. And then they're basically, I guess, left to suffer or even OD. And there could be so many community responses to an OD kind of crisis. Like, I know there's a resource in Chicago that gives out, um, what's the word, Narcan, to reverse like an opioid crisis. So these are just ideas of like how we could directly respond because the state does not care. They will leave, like they would, you know, send people back out if they survived an OD and they won't be able to get help. So yeah, just wanted to say everybody has a role no matter how small you matter in your community. I think that both you and Benji, Asha, touched on very important themes in abol abolition, which is that kind of de-relying de or destabilizing the reliance on having to call the police and building this kind of community feel in order to support when community members face these issues. Um, and I kind of want to direct our next question to Brisha. As a survivor of interpersonal violence, how has your experience with specifically family abuse informed your understanding of abolition? 
Um, I feel like it kind of like, I don't want to say like it helped me build my character, but it kind of helped me to like, it made my thoughts already. I'm sorry. Okay, let me see. So basically, I just feel like it kind of already made me think like it's a lot of dangerous stuff going on like outside of, you know what I mean? Like it's stuff already dangerous in my house. So it's like knowing that I can go outside and it could be 10 times worse. You know what I mean? Like I can go there and it can get 10 times worse. And it's like, it kind of made me want to stay away from everybody and stuff and kind of stay to myself. But in my heart, I knew like, this is not how life's supposed to be. You know what I mean? So I kind of knew like, this is not how life's supposed to be. And it kind of made me want to, that's another reason why, you know what I mean? I wanted to help other people because I know I didn't like the feeling at all. Like it used to make me feel kind of drained and dead inside. And I wanted to help other people know, like, you shouldn't have to feel like that either. And it's like being in my house all the time, because even if I wanted to go out, I wasn't allowed to go out because that's just how our house structure worked. We weren't going anywhere because they didn't want us really, you know, like saying anything to the outside world and then him being in trouble or something, you know? So it became like, I kind of just wanted to, I already felt caged in and then I went to jail and I was caged in and then I got out and I was on probation for like two years and, it, and then I was still caged in. So I guess it kind of all just builds that cage, you know, like that caged feeling and I kind of just wanted to end it and help other people not have to feel like that. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and how you see um, abolition. Um, this next question is for Asha. What are some of the challenges that you face while organizing? And I know you've mentioned earlier on, <laughs> I know you see here, you're, you're ready. Um, I know you mentioned earlier on, there's a lot of mutual aid organizing right now. Um, I'd like to ask, how has the current situation with the pandemic maybe affected that work as well? So just challenges and challenges from the pandemic too. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I had to think about that for a second, but uh, let's see. So the question is organizing and then mutual aid in a pandemic. So organizing is, <laughs> so, okay. You know what, I'm gonna start with how I got involved in organizing. And that was through SADAS, through the No Cop Academy campaign and with that campaign, that's where I learned like how a campaign should be because they offered like, they really supported the youth. You know, if we needed a ride, they would help us get a ride. If we needed some food, like they would address our immediate needs that would make us more present. And they would not like, they weren't adultists, which I really appreciated as like a teenager. And I feel like some challenges in organizing is like that relationship building because I remember in No Cop Academy, it was very intentional. Like we would have our weekly meetings. I felt so welcomed. Um, like sometimes we would have um, a check-in just to see how we were all doing before jumping in. We would have an agenda to see like, okay, what are we actually gonna do? And, you know, we follow through. And um, some challenges in organizing is just like relationship building, but also a challenge is like labor because what I notice is that these men, these men do not often organize in a way where like they may show up um, to certain, like they would take time kind of to spotlight, but they won't really do much of the labor. The labor um, disproportionately will fall on women, on gender non-conforming folks. And that's just been an issue that I've observed in like broader organizing spaces and stuff. And it's just like frustrating because like back to like the Black Panther Party, they had their issues with misogyny and patriarchy and just kind of like putting women who are often like the backbone of movements of society and gender conforming folks also. Um, that's just an issue that always frustrates me. And another kind of tidbit that I've been noticing is just anti-Blackness that weren't addressed in organizing. Because I remember like a lot of solidarity 
spaces or marches or actions just un unintentionally pledge being anti-Black just by how they treated Black youth organizers or how they um, just did not really give much attention or support or care to youth Black organizers. And I'm like, so y'all let them not have a way to get home or, you know, being called like the N-word. And I'm like, how is this solidarity? So there are a lot of issues in organizing spaces that I guess, you know, is a reflection of this society that we're trying to dismantle and change. But um, to, to go to the next question of mutual aid in a pandemic, that was like a struggle because we really had to intentionally plan out like, okay, how are we gonna do this? And we decided um, we would, you know, wear masks and wear gloves when we went to the encampment. And often like they wanna have masks, we wanna ask them to put on masks. Like we would provide masks um, just like to help. And we would help them get transportation and we would provide like hand sanitizer, but also, just like give them what they were requesting and couldn't really get access to because masks are expensive as well. I, I feel like people forget that, like they are really expensive. So, you know, we, I guess we took a chance, but um, it was really worth it because there, it's just such a shame how the city neglects the unhoused community. And I'm feeling like, well, yes, we're in a pandemic, but we still gotta support our people. And we just have to figure out how to do it in a safe, safer way. But there will always be risk, but you know, I, I don't know, I feel like it's worth it. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, Lil Tree, would you also like to jump in on this question about regarding like organizing? I think you both offer a unique perspective as youth organizers. Yeah, um, I started organizing. Okay, I'm an organizing baby. Wait, that's not even what it's called. My mama is Big Tree, who is right now the co-founder of Black Lives Matter Chicago. She is also the co-founder of Ugina Medics. She has done mad work with Stop um, in terms of mental health. And she has like her, her organizing career dates back all the way I don't know, as long as I can remember, my mama has been organizing. And so like, as long as I can remember, I was in the streets right next to her when they was fighting for trauma centers and things like that. Then at they meetings, that was, that was me and my mama's bonded time because otherwise she was organizing in ways that I couldn't participate in. Um, so I, I started organizing like, like being in rooms then. And I think really I got the spark when Rama Mayo was closing down all those schools, like, um, yeah, community radical truth. I started organizing, um, or not organizing, it really clicked in my head that no, this is this this world is intentionally trying to hurt us. Like, or not even this world, more so these systems, right? These things that we're supposed to be enjoying of, like school and things, are intentionally trying to hurt us. Um, and it was when Mama May was trying to close down all those schools, and one of the schools was my preschool, like cook, and I was so upset. Like, what do you and I remember coming home <laughs> from coming to a meeting and everything. Um, and my mom was like, yeah, so Robin Mayo is going to hold this like meeting or town hall or whatever, and we're going to be able to see him and stuff like that. And so I went home from one of the meetings and I was practicing my speech of what I was going to say to him. And I just, I remember being like, why would you hurt all those kids? And it was really sad and sweet. But, and I just remember my mama walking in and just looking at me and I don't know, I feel like that's really when the spark came in. Challenges through that though has always been like balancing that like I don't know. It's tiring <laughs> when I think about Little Tree, Little Little Tree, who is in her room practicing that speech. I'm like, you should have been learning how to double dutch, <laughs> working on your double dutch game. Like, I don't know. I just, it's yeah. When I I just think about that, and I think challenges within organizing is, it's it's always that balance of like people say self care, like after an action, please take care of yourself, take care of yourself. And when day well, I'm waking up tomorrow, I'm gonna do another action. I don't really know even know how to articulate it. I feel like though, but like within the organizing community, the, the struggle is taking care of ourselves, practicing what we preach. Honestly, I think like you know, folks will sit there and go to jail. We do jail support, and we'd be like, take care of yourselves. And then the next day, like we're all still out there, like 
not even investing in ourselves to continue investing in our communities to continue to ask and demand for um the city to invest in our communities and stuff um, I feel like I got lost with the question, but yeah, I just, I think that is my biggest, has been my biggest turmoil, right? Like, especially over the summer of youth, just like, oh my gosh, last summer was just a summer of tokenizing youth and everything, but youth was out there hard and it was going cool and just having to balance that, like the fight is still here, even though I was out there for weeks upon weeks upon weeks watching everybody in my house get beat on by police and having to just, I don't know, it gets it gets sad it gets sad really quickly and it sometimes it'd be real hard to turn that back into motivation thank you asha and little tree for answering that question i think it's very important that we have you know youth such as ourselves including grisha as well that have kind of experienced and worked towards this like new kind of abolition in our generation and Lil Tree, like you said last summer was kind of really major for youth and you know youth showed out and really represented how change must happen um thank you panelists for answering those questions now we will be trans transitioning into an open kind of um question and answering segment um and the first question i'm going to ask just to pose and kind of start the discussion off is concerning reparations. What role do reparations play in the struggle towards abolition? Well, I have a controversial opinion about reparations. Uh, <laughs> like, I understand that people like won't feel this, but how I just don't feel like reparations is like the end game for us. For me, I just I want black liberation. I want um, indigenous sovereignty. I want black self determination, not reparations. Because, like honestly, the state they owe us so much that if we really want reparations, the state would be dismantled. I feel like the United States as a whole would need to go if black people were to be free. Because the United States, like, what can they really give us? They they abused us. They've taken our land. They destroyed. Like, they contributed to colonialism in Africa. They engage in militarism all across the world. And at this point, I'm like, I don't think you know money reparations can really. I don't know. It won't. It won't undo the damage that the United States has brought upon the earth. And I just. Like the fight for reparations, like you see what happened in Evanston, that was not reparations. Those were like, weren't those like housing loans or something? Like, and then they pinpointed the first city to give like reparations. I'm like, no, that's not what we need. That does not really help us. So yeah, the damage is literally irreparable. And at this point, we gotta, we need, we need something new. The United States, yes, money cannot fix trauma. I kind of wish, like, I wonder what could the United States become? And I'm like, I don't know, but it will not be the United States because that is not working. It like it has to use violence to maintain itself. It needs exploitation to maintain itself. It needs oppression. So we need to think of something different. And sometimes I'm like, could indigenous um, nations, like, I don't know, I feel like they should get their land back and kind of rule. I don't know. but. Just some ideas. I get. I just don't get with reparations. Yeah, I just it, when I hear reparations, it immediately makes me think of fifty acres and a mule, <laughs> and I immediately get pissed off. <laughs> like, I don't. I don't know. I think reparation has says that I'm still asking. Reparation says this is like. I don't know, you stepped on my foot so you can take me shopping. Like, I don't know. Uh, reparations to me just seems like a band-aid. Like it is not actually like how we address harm, right? It doesn't sound like addressing what causes of harm and violence. It sounds like a band-aid. Reparations to me sounds like um making it look good, not feel good. Um, and yeah, I just <laughs> reparations, no, I I want and then it's also like reparations looks different to everybody like maybe reparations to people in Hyde Park looks like 
making the rest of these communities look like Hyde Park and no, bye. <laughs> a lot of people be like, reparations is, yeah, everybody needs a car in the city. And I'm like, it's so bad for the earth. Reparations like could look different for everybody. And I think reparations more speaks to a personal thing that addresses my immediate needs. And I don't think that as addressing root causes of violence and harm that the state has caused and also reparations says to me still asking says you still have something you can give me no i just want y'all gone that's what that's it don't give me nothing don't shake my hand you ain't my friend because you've been digging the garbage can like no just leave i'm sorry y'all um reparations says that we can still have a relationship no you was a dirty bum ex and you did me dirty and i'm moving on <laughs> Okay, we've got a question that came in to the Zoom q and I'm gonna read it, but we'd like to direct it to Benji. So an anonymous question, it, um, it was anonymous, sorry. I remember years ago following some of the work of Ceasefire slash Cure Violence, which gained some more publicity with the film, The Interrupters. I was encouraged by the work that had been done and was really disappointed when funding for these programs were cut. I'm also starting to learn more about people who informally do this type of work in their own neighborhoods. With a change of administration, as I believe Rauner was instrumental in shutting down funds for these orgs, what are current discussions around reinstating funds for these, type of, these types of programs? Is that something that abolitionists should push, should push for as conversations around defunding the police continue, as well as learning ways to negotiate slash resolve conflict ourselves? And this will be put in the chat. <laughs> um, absolutely. And I want to enter into that by saying, sort of jumping off of what Lil Tree and Asha were saying in response to the last question. I think it's important to remember that reparations literally means repair. That's literally where the word comes from. Um, and I think part of the problem is the way that what what repair consists of is we're in a moment where it's being hijacked and where it's being um, appropriated by uh, the, the very systems and structures that reparations were originally created. The, 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 the demand was originally created to address and undo um, in much the same way that I think Asha and Lil Tree are demanding. So I, I want to start it off there to say that all of the solutions, again, that even the, the, the most radical solutions that we're putting forward in this conversation are imperfect solutions. Um, and the question is always, how do, wh what are the steps that we take to the bigger undoings and to the bigger uh, abolishings that I think Asha was alluding to? Um, like, what are the things we can do this today, this week, this month, this year that begin to chip away at these systems because we know the systems don't go away overnight? Um, but are the steps that we're taking actually threatening them or are they actually reinforcing them? And I completely agree with Asha and Lil Tree that the reparations ordinance in Evanston, for example, is an example of actually reinforcing those systems while calling it reparations, while calling it repair. Um, and it was not, and it is not. Um, and we need to demand things that are, an, that are an actual threat to these systems, even when they're imperfect. Like defunding the police, I would argue, is actually a very mild demand. <laughs> it's actually not a very radical demand. The Chicago Police Department gets $107 billion, excuse me, $100.7 uh, billion, 1.7. I don't know where my, I don't know what's wrong with my tongue today. $1.7 billion uh, annually. And to, to, to demand that just a fraction of that be taken away is such a mild demand. That's such a, it's a small, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the larger things that we need and that we're fighting for. But I think it's an important step because it chips away. Even if it only chips away a little bit, it's, it's movement in the right direction. Even if it's only small movement, it's movement in the right direction. Um, so that being said, I absolutely think uh, funding things like Circles and Ciphers um, I, I say them because they're an organization I'm more uh, uh, familiar with. You know, I want to I want to speak the names of organizations whose work that I'm familiar with, and I'm not as familiar with Ceasefire. Um, uh, so funding, uh, when we say defund the police, we're always talking about funding alternatives, not just taking money away. We're talking about taking resources away and then reinvesting them into the things that we actually know do prevent violence and harm. And I absolutely think 
community-based solutions to de-escalation, community-based solutions to addressing harm and conflict when they come up um, is crucial to that work of community building and trusting community to be the ones that respond. Um, and again, I think if you're from a Black community, if you're from uh, a poor and working class community, that's actually already something people do. Um, it may not be called abolition or it may not be done in a, a, from a specific political lens or, or named with these uh, kind of buzz jargon movement words that we use. Um, but this is something people do in their own communities all the time. And I think A, understanding that that is abolitionist work is an important step, but then B, also saying, this is actually the work that's, <laughs> this is actually what's working to stop violence. So that's where the resources need to go. Resources actually need to go into the organizations and the teams and the um, groups of young people um, that are the ones who are actually uh, on the front lines in their own neighborhoods intervening to stop their friends from hurting each other. Um, we need to actually look at what people within the community are doing to successfully stop violence and harm, and we need to invest in those programs with the resources that we are uh, depleting from the, the, the police and prison system. Um, yes, that was that was brilliantly said. Uh, I completely agree. It kind of leads me into my next question, which I will direct towards Brisha, and it concerns the involvement of young people. In your opinion, and what do advice what advice do you have for other young people who get caught up in the system? Um, for me, the thing that got me to um, kind of keep going through, I had a whole lot of support. So for other people, this might not be the same. So I'm gonna like say it for both, but for people like for me, like I had a whole lot of support and for me reading like letters and stuff in jail kind of used to keep me going. It used to kind of like make me feel like I'm not alone. So even for people that don't have support, knowing that you're not the only one that's going through the situation and letting yourself, it's like a lot of people try to numb how they feel when they're in jail and stuff. And well, I don't know about everybody, but I, I know a lot of the people that were in there, they would tell me like, they kind of just numb it and they were going through the same situations over and over again because of the things that were going on at home. So it was like, letting yourself feel how you feel is okay because it's like, it builds knowledge and character. Like it builds a lot of knowledge. And so I just feel like, like having that and knowing that, you know what I mean? Like other people are going through it it like kept me going and it made me want to, you know what I mean? Like it made me want to keep, I don't know how to like say it. I don't want to say keep going because it's not like I was going to die from being in there, but it's like, it's draining. It's really mentally draining and you got to keep a positive attitude and you got to keep fighting. You can't really stop, you know, because once you let yourself get into a negative place, it's like, it makes it worse, I guess. You know what I mean? I don't know. Um, yeah, but basically, I don't know. I would just keep reaching out. That's what I had to do. As much as it like felt pointless to keep reaching out, I kept doing it. And in the long run, that helped me because it like let people see like no matter how it ended, it's like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I keep coming over my words. Um Okay, yeah. So basically just that, just that, I don't know, just keep keeping a positive attitude, keep reaching out because as much as everybody thinks like that, it doesn't help, it does, like, you know what I mean? Like you have to keep, keep doing it. You gotta keep doing it, you know what I mean? No matter if the cops are telling you no, like the cops specifically told me like, go back home to where everything was going wrong. And it's like, I still was telling myself like, no, I'm gonna keep trying. I'm gonna go to the next person. You know, the cops don't listen, I'm gonna go to CSB. CSB don't listen, I'm gonna go to the counseling. The counseling don't work, I'm gonna go here. You know what I mean? You gotta keep trying to reach out. <laughs> I just wanna quickly comment to you, Brisha, that I agree that communication is very important in terms of how we've kind of normalized the prison system and people who are incarcerated um, either because they were convicted or not, that we kind of dehumanize them and forget that they are people as well. 
Um, and that just helps push the narrative that prisons are necessary and that people need to be in prisons. Um, I'm only responding because I have a personal connection to that. Um, but it's something I wanted to say to you that I appreciate that you said that out loud so that people know that communication with those that are incarcerated is important in kind of maintaining community and uh, humanizing people that are incarcerated. So thank you. You're welcome. And it's like, it becomes really easy for a lot of people to give up once they see like that they keep reaching out to everybody. It gets to a point where a lot of people give up because they feel like it's pointless, you know, especially with the government and like policing and stuff going on. It's like, especially when you're like African-American, it's like, you already know all the odds are against you. You know what I mean? You know, nobody's really going to believe you. So it's like, you got to keep, you got to keep talking. So, you know what I mean? Like, I think that was the biggest thing that helped me is even after I got out of jail, I still kept, you know, talking and letting people know because even telling my story, so many people have told me like, just hearing my story alone has inspired them to do better, you know what I mean? Like, and to keep going and to, you know, keep trying to keep telling and stuff like that. And to hear that, it's like, it means a lot. You know what I mean? Like it really does because it's like, I know that I'm still helping people now to this day, you know? Yes, exactly. Um, we did receive a question in the Q&A box. So, um, which actually Lil Tree kind of talked about, it pertains to self-care. The question is, um, how do you feel about the mainstream narratives of self-care? What does care and rest look like in your spaces and communities? And how can we shift the focus to community care? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately myself, because in some ways, I feel like there, there should be like a gradient, or I don't know, like a, there's this artist who like portrayed it beautifully, in which it was like individual, then community, but they're like interwined. And I don't like when self care becomes hyper individualized, because that doesn't, that doesn't always really do it. I don't know. It doesn't really, because I don't know, we all need support. We all need healing. We need to heal together, though, to some extent, because it's hard just trying to hold all that to yourself. Like, you'll go mad. I don't know. And I think with community care, I feel like you do need some time to yourself. Like, I, I love the idea of self-care kids. I remember um, people sending self-care kids, I'm like, oh, this is so sweet for when you just need a day to rest, but also understand like when we rest, you know, we need periods of rest, but then, you know, in those times of action, we need to embrace community care and community debriefs after actions or after campaign meetings. And I feel like it's a nice building opportunity, but yeah, we need more community care in which kind of like emphasizes self-care, but also gives space for self-care, like understanding your capacity, I feel like a self-care, understanding um, like how to divide labor is community care. Because if a lot of people are doing um, specific tasks, but it, you know, it's not getting done, then your campaign will kind of fall apart because you just didn't really organize that right. And I'm like, yeah, we need to kind of embrace both. Yeah, I just, who I had so many conflicting thoughts on self-care. And I think a lot of them started coming because I had some rude people who, who told me I didn't love myself. And, and yeah, they're rude. But like, ask me, do you love yourself and stuff? And it's just like, I think my self-love, and it makes me think about stuff. Like, what, what is that? What is that? I'm off the net. We call the book <laughs> self-care. Like, I think the way like we socialize about self-care is it's almost like when people say like, like now, like, I don't know. I, it's just so weird. Like now, especially in the organizing community, it feels like how when people be like, hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Oh, that's good to hear. Like literally it's good. Like, I don't know. Take care. Like make sure you take care of yourself. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, I just, I've never really had a real conversation about like, I don't know, like 
know you get a conversation like birds and the bees type conversations. Like, this is how you take care of yourself and da 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 da. And it's kind of just been like, even when I inquire about it, it's like, oh, I don't know. I think, yeah, as a community, we got to do a lot better at, at talking about it, exploring it, and practicing it as a community. You know, just like, you know, you teach somebody how to ride a bike before you just tell them ride a bike, you know? Um, I think about Chicago Freedom School and how they took their Freedom Fellows to goat yoga. Like, I was so jealous. And I was just, I never thought of that, like, as self-care. Like, that is an option for me, you know? And I think that is also a big part of it, like, you know, just trying to expand what, what self-care can be and not just, like, make sure you take a day off, get some sleep, eat some food. I, like, I really don't like when people tell me go journal or something or like therapy as a food. I, I just, I'd be like, are you kidding me? Do I got the time? Do I got the capacity? You got the moolah, do you, you know? And I just, or like, yeah. And I just know at my house, like we have a creation station and it's like tons of canvases, paint. There's all types of medias, markers and all of the above. We have hula hoops, we got excellent. It's all these just random things that you could just do in our house and just, always having something at your hands, at your reach to like, I don't know, do something with your hands because I don't know, mine and I was coming empty hands is a, something for the devil. And honestly, still hands, yes, when my hands are still and I'm not doing anything, it's mostly I'm in my head and going down here. And I just, yeah, I think when people say self-care and all of that, I just be like, what is that? And as a community, we need to like talk about it more, practice it more with each other, like showing up at protests more with hula hoops and more things to draw with and more, when we come to meetings, like more little fidget toys and stuff like that, right? So also not just telling people to take self-care, but also showing people and not showing people what self-care is, but expanding, like allowing them to see the options that they have available. And not only just what's available, but making it available to them, making it accessible to them, right? You know, I just always leave the actions. People be like, take care of yourself. Make sure you know, do some self-care and stuff. You know I gotta come back tomorrow. You know you're looking for me to chant lead tomorrow. Why are you telling me that? Like you ain't asking me to come back to this action tomorrow. So really what you're trying to say is, I don't know. Um, and yeah, so like, I just, I think what does it look like that as organizations, we take just trips to the beach? Like, um, what does it look like to just go sit by the lake and just have a debrief there, right? Have picnics and things like that. I know we have pandemics now, but what does it look like, right? That like, we just hop on Zoom and share a meal and stuff like that. Um, and just teaching people, because I know especially people in my neighborhood, in my community, you tell them, take some self-care. You They're going to look at you like, you want me to take a bubble bath? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, people, they're going to be like, yeah, I don't know. They tell me real niggas don't take baths, but anyways. Anyways, I think that, and then the other thing I, was, I wrote down, oh, very much when I hear the connotation of self-care, it really should be like self-preservation. I know when I hear it, I'd be like, okay, I need to take care of myself. What is something that I can do in the immediate right now to make whatever I'm feeling chop up? And usually that just be like, go smoke or something. Um, which is, you know, you ask some people in their self-care and you ask other people and it's like, they don't do, it's a band-aid, you know? Complicated issues over there. But I think like, yeah, just like, I don't know. Self-care don't really seem accessible. It's kind of like something people just say like, all right, I'm good. You know? Yeah. Thank you so much for that response, Little Tree. I I really like that your discussion revolved around expanding self-care and care in general from pinpointing to it, pinpointing it from one individual to everybody. It's everyone's responsibility and making it accessible. Um, Asha, I know you have one more comment. I do just want to say, though, um, we are at time. And so I would just like if everybody could, perhaps all of the panelists, just give a one sentence takeaway that they want people to have in closing. I would love to say that Ruth Gilmore, right? Ruth Gilmore Wilson said that abolition is a presence. And I feel like we should take that to heart more. Um, like we're, like in the dismantling, we're also creating something better for us. So I guess that's the sentence I wanna end on. Um, 
Um, I think the sentence I want to end on is to just continue to educate ourselves. Like we have to continue to educate ourselves and just kind of, yeah, just continue to educate ourselves and keep pushing and being persistent because being persistent is definitely going to be the key, I feel. I think I would like to close by saying demand and support material shifts, demand and support material changes. It's not enough to say Black Lives Matter if we're not uh, demanding the dismantling of the systems that degrade Black lives. It's not enough to say stop Asian hate if we're not demanding an end to the systems that teach us to hate and distrust Asian and immigrant people. Um, and I really want to encourage you, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, whenever you're afraid, whenever th those, those real and, and, and understandable and human responses of fear come up when we try to imagine a police and a prison-free world, um, try to imagine the fear of the people, the, the fear that certain people fear living in a world with police and prisons. Um, when you're afraid of a vision of a world without ICE, without borders, without militarism, try and imagine and try and empathize with the people who live in fear because of borders, because of ICE, because of the military, because of police and prisons, um, and try and be courageous in imagining what is possible and in, and, and in imagining a world where no one has to live in fear. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I wish it was hard. I, what, the song is still going in my head. Lean on me. Lean on me. Yeah, I just, lean on your people. Lean on your people. And yeah, I just, we living in the world where we leaning on people who are not our people, aka the state, aka the police, aka people who have shown over and over again that they don't care about people. Um, and yeah, that's. Thank you for such powerful takeaways. I've got I've got goosebumps. Those are all so good. Um, is Jayla still with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, there we go. Passing <laughs> it off to you then. Okay, perfect. Okay, now I'd like to thank take a moment to thank the amazing panelists here, Brescia Meadows, Asha Edwards, Lil Tree, and Benji Hart for being here today. Your presence is much appreciated. You have inspired me through your great responses. And to the audience, I am convinced that our panelists here have moved you all today as well. They have, they have informed us that when they say abolish the police, they mean dismantling all systems that are causing harm. There is inequality within education, housing, in the workplace and health resources. We have, to, we have got to ask ourselves, what can I do to fight against all forms of violence that has been embedded into our society? including state violence. Our panelists highlighted that there is no five-step process, but, when we, but we can start by leaning towards our communities and having direct investments into community resources that, address, that will address our immediate and long-term needs. We need to support one another and build community where it is missing. I also want to give appreciation to my peers in my class who made this event possible. That was an outstanding job. And everyone in attendance will receive an email from our Black Studies Department, which will include some additional resources on what has been discussed today. I am confident that together we can bring light upon the darkness and abolish these unjust systems. And maybe, as Asha said, abolish the United States that has been built on violence and everything. <laughs> so this is abolition and revolutionary imagination. Thank you for being here with us today and take care. Ooh. Thank y'all for having me. Thank you. I'm so glad y'all listened and tuned in and asked amazing, insightful questions. Um, thank you. <laughs> oh, wait. Thank you so much, everyone. It's 80 degrees. Get warm.